Let me mute myself. I'm ready. Yeah. yeah, we are live on YouTube right now. So, uh, shall we begin? So I, I request uh, people to uh, switch off their videos uh, till the question answer session. So I preserve bandwidth. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am MS Ram. Welcome to the first talk in the Let's Talk Primates series. I'm sure the speaker we have today uh, needs no introduction. He is as renowned for the popularization of primate behavior as he is for his exemplary research on topics such as uh, primate aggression, uh, territorial behavior, communication, and disease ecology. He is interested in what we can learn about human evolution from studying the behavior and ecology of our closest living relatives, that is the chimpanzees. He believes that the study of chimpanzees provides many fascinating insights into the possible lives of our ancestors and provides a context for understanding ourselves today. I welcome Dr. Michael Lawrence Wilson from University of Minnesota. Uh, Mike, the platform is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to your society. The, uh, uh, it's a, a great honor. And I am, was very happy to learn that the uh, Association of Indian Primatologists had been formed. Uh, it's so important for the future of primates that people in the habitat countries study them and maintain long-term research on uh, these fascinating creatures. And uh, so the work that, that all of you are doing is, is very important for uh, both conservation and uh, science so that we can understand our primate kin better. So today I will be uh, talking about uh, various research that is currently ongoing in my lab. I asked uh, my student Nisarg Desai what I should talk to you about and, and he suggested that uh, people would be most interested in hearing uh, kind of an overview of, of what is happening in, uh, in my lab, uh, what my graduate students and associated researchers are working on. And so I will do an overview of those topics. And so a lot of this is stuff that has not been published yet. Uh, so it's work that's in progress. And so I'll be giving you kind of an overview of the questions that we're interested in and the techniques that we're using to try to answer them and we'll share with you uh, some of our preliminary conclusions for these uh, different research topics. First of all, I want to share with you this cartoon from the, the webcomic XKCD, which is based on data from Vaclav Smil, who estimated the biomass of all of the land vertebrates on the Earth. Uh, so this is uh, focusing on the land mammals uh, on the planet. And every square represents 1 million metric tons of animal mass. And in the middle here, we have our own species, humans. Uh, there are, what, 7.5 billion of us now. And then uh, the gray squares are our livestock, our cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, horses, and uh, various other mammals that we uh, keep for our benefit. And in the green squares are the wild animals, the land mammals that live uh, not as domesticated animals, but in the forests and grasslands and deserts and so on. And as you can see from this figure, there are not very many wild animals left. The total biomass of wild mammals is just a fraction of the biomass of land mammals. Uh, it's mostly dominated by humans, our livestock, and pets. Even elephants, which are enormous, so they represent a lot of biomass, they fill up a whole square, or at least they did at the time uh, these data were 
uh, calculated, uh, elephants are just a single square out of all of this, and because of the intense uh, pressure on elephants, with many of them being killed for ivory, uh, there are probably far fewer elephants than a whole square now. So this figure raises some interesting questions, uh, in particular two big questions. How did humans achieve this capacity to take over the planet? And what can we do to ensure that these green squares don't disappear entirely, to ensure that the other wild animals on the planet survive into the future? And I'll be looking at both of these questions today. I've coined a term, uh, the anthropomata, to try to describe the um, humans and our team. Uh, you can hear one of the anthropomata uh, meowing in the background. I have a cat here who is participating in the lecture. Um, so these come, this term I've put together from the uh, Greek terms anthropo for humans, represented here by some uh, Americans, and mata meaning team. So together, the human team are the various animals and plants that we uh, coexist with. The crops, livestock, the pets, and also the tools, including machines that we use uh, to dominate the planet. And so humans are not just one species that have taken over the planet. Humans are a team of species and machines and other tools that have taken over the planet together. We are our own kind of ecosystem that has rapidly taken over the world. Human societies share some interesting features in common. My primary point, appointment is in an anthropology department, and as anthropologists we're very interested in human diversity and how people differ in different parts of the world. And here are some images from a book, Material World from the 1980s, in which they asked uh, people uh, in many different parts of the world to uh, take all of their possessions out of their house and stand in front of their house with their families and their stuff. So you can see some of the stuff that people in different parts of the world have. And in some ways people are very diverse, we're very different in, in different countries, but at the same time there are many things that bind us all together. We are all one distinct species. And some characteristics that we share that are distinct from our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, are that uh, we tend to have stable breeding bonds. Uh, here we have families uh, in all of these different parts of the world. That's very typical. And these families gather together in larger societies. And again, this is an unusual kind of social arrangement for primates. It's not unheard of, but there aren't many other primate species in which there are stable breeding bonds of families uh, that join together in larger associations. And what has enabled people to take over the planet is our intense cooperation with one another and with other species, our livestock and crops uh, that we um, together uh, promote uh, our inclusive fitness in a kind of mutually beneficial way. Uh, so we cooperate intensively and of course we have language which makes it possible for me to communicate with you right now which appears to be unique among all animals. So how and why did humans evolve these traits? These are big mysteries, these are big puzzles, I don't have the answers to them but ongoing work in my lab seeks to at least add some pieces to the enormous puzzle that evolutionary anthropologists and biologists and other uh, researchers have been trying to put together uh, over the past uh, many years. Most of the work in my lab involves field work of primates in different parts of Africa. And uh, the great majority of what I'll be talking to you about today uh, and most of my own current work is focused on the chimpanzees of Uganda in western Tanzania. But um, 
In Gombe, there are not only chimpanzees, there are also other primates, including baboons. I'll talk a little bit about some ongoing work uh, with, the bamboo, with the baboon project in Gombe. And I will also talk a little bit about some work of, uh, on other primates, including gelata monkeys in Ethiopia and bonobos, which are our other closest living relative, along with chimpanzees in Kokolopori in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I will also talk a little bit about some uh, ongoing work in Chambura Gorge in Uganda. The primates that I have just shown and that people in my lab are working on are related to humans to different extents. So bonobos and chimpanzees are equally co close cousins of ours. They're the two living species most closely related to us. And the other uh, primates that people in my lab study, olive baboons, gelatas, um, and a little bit hamadryas baboons, also in Ethiopia, these are more distantly related to us. They're old world monkeys, uh, like many of the uh, primates that live in India are. Uh, they're more distantly related to us, but they also provide important uh, information about how traits evolve. Uh, some traits that these other primates have are more similar in certain ways uh, to humans than the social behavior, for example, of chimpanzees or bonobos. And so it's, it's useful to look at other primates that have evolved convergently similar traits to humans. I will be uh, talking about the following work that's underway uh, on these different topics. The first topic, uh, sex and violence, relates to things that I've been working on for a long time with intergroup aggression. Uh, I've done um, quite a bit of work on intergroup violence in chimpanzees, intergroup killing. I won't be talking very much about that today. Instead, I'll be focusing on work on uh, within group violence. Uh, in particular work by uh, my graduate student, Anthony uh, Massaro, Tony Massaro, and um, also work on a related topic by Maud Mujuno on bonobos. I'll be talking about vocal communication, uh, particularly work by Nisarg Desai, and then uh, stable isotope ecology, uh, including uh, work on chimpanzees and baboons by uh, Rebecca Knockertz, and uh, this relates to some work on chimpanzees living in more open savanna habitat in Uganda uh, by Nicole Simmons, who's uh, a graduate student at Makarero University in Uganda, who's been writing up her dissertation in my lab. And I'll talk about multi-level societies and their evolution, uh, including uh, work on gelata monkeys by my graduate student Carrie Miller, and work on virtual primates by my graduate student Christy Krauss. And finally, I'll talk about work on conservation of chimpanzees and other wildlife and their habitats in Tanzania uh, by my graduate student, Eli Huruma Wilson Kimaro. Here is a uh, picture of many of these uh, people in my lab, together with Jane Goodall, who visited Minnesota uh, not too long ago. And of course, uh, Jane Goodall's work is really central to uh, well, it's made possible uh, all of the work that I'm currently doing at Gombe. She began the research at Gombe in 1960 and has worked uh, through her foundation, the Jane Goodall Institute, to ensure that that research has kept going for 60 years now. This is the 60th year of research at Gombe. This is Gombe National Park uh, in western Tanzania, and it is a mosaic of habitat. The green here shows where there's evergreen forest in the valleys of, of streams uh, in, uh, that cross the, the park on their way down from the escarpment of the Rift Valley uh, flowing west to, to Lake Tanganyika. But there is also quite a bit of open woodland and grassland in Savannah, or grassland in, in Gombe, this kind of mixed habitat is very similar to what has been reconstructed for the habitats of early hominins like uh, Ardipithecus. And uh, so it 
provides a very interesting landscape to work in for people who are interested in the uh, evolution of, of humans. Uh, it's also a very interesting landscape to follow chimpanzees and uh, baboons in. The first topic I'll focus on here is sex and violence. This is a very blurry photo of uh, some chimpanzees in action. Uh, it's hard to get clear photos of chimpanzees when they're moving around quickly. Uh, but here we see a female who has a full sexual swelling who is uh, moving away from this male, Fudge, who is the alpha male. And he's displaying at this female and causing these other individuals uh, to move out of his way and flee. And this is the sort of thing that you will see a lot of if you spend time following chimpanzees. Uh, this is kind of a um, low-level degree of aggression. Nobody was hurt in this incident. Uh, and such low-level aggression is pretty common. Uh, but from time to time, chimpanzees engage in uh, more severe violence as well. And Leading this work is Tony Massaro, who's in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior, where I have a joint appointment. And he is working mainly with the long-term data. Uh, he was in Gombe uh, earlier this year, but was forced to come back to the United States because of uh, the COVID pandemic. And so his research currently is focusing on uh, what can be gleaned from computer databases and statistics. But given the uh, massive long-term database uh, and ex extremely detailed long-term database that we have for Gombe chimpanzees, uh, we can learn a lot from that. The project that Tony is focusing on at the moment really begins with this male, Vincent, who is the alpha male of the Mitumba community. And in September of 2004, the chimpanzees in his community were hunting monkeys, uh, red colobus monkeys, and he was trying to take a colobus monkey that had been captured by other chimpanzees. And in the um, kind of confusion of, of grabbing that monkey, he fell about 30 meters from a tree, and he badly injured himself. And at the time, the Matumba community, which is uh, one of the three chimpanzee communities in Gombe, they are a small community, very much at risk of intergroup threat from the larger Kasekela community. And when Vincent fell, he was one of only three adult males in the Matumba community. And so from a human perspective, you might expect, well, if if the alpha male has fallen and hurt himself, you would really go out of your way to try to help him and bring him food and uh, you know help him do, do better so that he heals and can recover. And instead, the other males uh, were aggressive towards him, and he went off by himself uh, into the forest for several months, avoiding the other males. In December of 2004, he met up with the other males after they had been hunting monkeys. Maybe he heard the sounds and was interested in trying to get some meat. And when they saw Vincent, instead of welcoming him, giving him food, uh, being friendly to him, they attacked him uh, viciously and killed him. And here is Vincent's body. This is a photograph I took the morning after he was killed. Uh, they beat on his body extensively and bit him and inflicted all sorts of horrible damage on him until he was dead. Since the killing of Vincent, other males within the Matumba community have been killed. Uh, some of these have been observed, some have been uh, inferred. We have strong circumstantial evidence, and there are some suspected cases as well. This figure here um, I think it's a little bit outdated, uh, but it gives the general idea that in the Matumba community, uh, there are a lot of these within group killings. This is something that has been observed and reported for other chimpanzee sites across Africa. These are data from my 2014 paper in Nature, where we looked across uh, chimpanzees and bonobos for evidence of uh, killings. 
And uh, most of those killings were intergroup killings, but some occurred intra-group or within communities. Uh, some of these involved killings of, of weaned males. And the Matuma community has an exceptionally high share of these. And so this raises questions about why this is the case. Why so many killings within Mitumba? The work that uh, Tony is focusing on right now um, hypothesizes that the key factor here is the degree to which fertile females can be monopolized by the alpha male. So uh, this figure here on the x-axis shows the number of females in a community, and on the y-axis is a calculation based on this equation here from a paper uh, by uh, Charlie Nunn back in 1999 to calculate the probability that less than or equal to one female uh, is mating at any given time. And this is based on the reproductive parameters of chimpanzees, how long their sexual cycles last, um, how long their inner birth intervals are, and so on. And what this shows is that the fewer the number of females are, the um, fewer, the lower the odds are that um, more than one female will be cycling at any given time. And so, for example, in a community with only five females, then over 90% of the time that any female is fertile and mating, there's just one female mating. And when there's just one female mating, by the priority of access model that Stuart Altman developed for baboons, uh, we expect that the highest ranking male will be able to monopolize that female's mating unless she takes steps to avoid him, such as going on a consortship with another male. So in a community with, with only five females, then the, the alpha male can usually monopolize all the matings. In a community with 10 females, it becomes harder to do so because about 20% of the time there will be other, uh, more than one female mating at any given time, and, and so on as we increase the number of females in a community, uh, it becomes harder and harder for the alpha male to be the only male who's mating with those females. And uh, plotting some actual data here from uh, Chambura Gorge, Mitumba, and Kasakela, the larger community in Gombe, we see a reasonably good uh, fit to this uh, prediction that when there are fewer females in a community, it's easier to monopolize those matings. And we also have genetic data now showing that uh, in, in Mitumba, the alpha male has been able to sire uh, something like 80% or more of all of the infants that have been born in the community, which is much higher than the rate for the Casakela community. A consequence of this is that in a small community, being the alpha male is a bigger prize than in a large community. And so insofar as males are motivated to do what it takes to monopolize matings, a male can benefit from eliminating his male rivals, uh, killing them off, uh, to uh, ensure that he maintains his monopoly. And that's what uh, Edgar, who's the current alpha male of Matumba, has been doing. Uh, after he helped kill Vincent, uh, he has been involved in um, up to four additional within-group killings of other males in his community. Um, at least one of those, we were not really sure who uh, the attacker was, but uh, in the other cases, Edgar is strongly implicated in the attacks. So it looks like he's been um, eliminating his rivals, especially when they're still young males, not fully grown, uh, and he's able to kill them at lower cost to himself. So chimpanzees differ quite strikingly from bonobos in their uh, level of aggression, and this is a topic that uh, hasn't received quite as much attention as it should because of the ongoing uh, warfare in 
the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the only place that bonobos live, uh, the uh, the first and second Congo wars disrupted ongoing research on bonobos, and the uh, instability that has lingered since then has made bonobo studies uh, continue to be somewhat difficult, but there is sufficient peace going on in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo that bonobo research has resumed, and my graduate student Maud Mujino has been uh, working with uh, Martin Serbeck, who has a field site at Kokolopori, uh, studying bonobos, and Maud has done preliminary research and is currently working on her uh, prospectus uh, to plan her research on uh, male reproductive strategies in bonobos, and she plans to do hormonal analysis of uh, testosterone to see how uh, hormone levels relate to male reproductive strategies in the species. So this is work that is still in early stages, and the COVID epidemic has made it difficult to do any of this uh, because uh, none of us are in the field right now. Uh, but uh, we do hope to resume field work uh, in the coming, uh, well, as soon as we can, which might be in the next year sometime. And bonobos appear to have quite different strategies for achieving reproductive success. Uh, males are generally regarded as being less aggressive in bonobos than they are in chimpanzees and engage in more friendly behavior towards females than in chimpanzees. And so Mode will be working on that topic. Uh, so, so that's early stages. We don't have any conclusions yet, but stay tuned. This uh, will be interesting to see what, what Mode learns. And uh, this is a photo that Mode took when she was at Kokolopori last summer, and uh, bonobos uh, spend a lot of time uh, grooming one another, and compared to chimpanzee males, uh, male bonobos uh, appear to invest more in friendly behavior towards females. And uh, Martin Serbeck has uh, proposed that this uh, requires them to modulate their testosterone levels differently from chimpanzees so that they uh, can reduce their levels of aggression towards females. Moving away from sex and violence towards vocal communication, people have long been interested in what chimpanzees say to each other because as one of our two closest living relatives, one might think that compared to other primates, they have more similarities to humans uh, in their vocal communication, that maybe chimpanzees have more language-like features of their vocalizations. Work by John Matani and others found some evidence in support of this expectation in that chimpanzees appear to have vocal dialects. Uh, John Matani compared recordings that he made of chimpanzees in uh, Mahali Mountains National Park in Tanzania with recordings that Peter Marler had made of chimpanzees in Gombe and found that there were subtle but distinct differences in the pant hoot vocalizations in these uh, two different regions. And other researchers have since gone on to find evidence of chimpanzee dialects uh, elsewhere in Africa. And the existence of chimpanzee dialects is of interest to researchers in language evolution because it suggests that chimpanzees have vocal learning, uh, which is not common in mammals, although it is common in birds. And Peter Marler, who was the first to record chimpanzee vocalizations, was also one of the pioneers in the study of dialects in birdsong. Now, the variation between different chimpanzee populations in their pant hoot vocalizations is quite subtle compared to the variation among songbird dialects. And so this raises questions of 
you know, is this really vocal learning or could these be statistical artifacts or some other uh, factor that makes it appear as if chimpanzees have dialects? And so Nisar has been uh, working at Gombe to record uh, new chimpanzee vocalizations from chimpanzees in Mitumba and in Kasekela and compare their calls. And uh, he's currently working on uh, this analysis. It hasn't been published yet, but he's, he's getting close to uh, being ready to submit these results for publication. Here's a photo of Nisarg in the field uh, with uh, some of the Gombe chimpanzees. And uh, Nisarg has worked with a team of Tanzanian field assistants who have recorded calls from these two communities. And what Nisarg has found uh, so far uh, relates to this question, this issue that previous studies had reported differences in panthoot calls of chimpanzees in different sites. As I mentioned, it um, suggests a human-like ability to modify vocal production. And um, here are some preliminary data. Uh, these are spectrograms of uh, one male, uh, Samson, what his pant hoot calls look like. And I'll play a pant hoot call for you so you can get a sense of what these sound like. So that was a chimpanzee pant hoot. And they begin kind of softly with a uh, uh, buildup, and then they um, lead to a climax and often have a letdown at the end. And you can see the, um, you know, visually these uh, acoustic patterns. These are uh, a call that are frequently given by males. Females also produce pantoots, though not as often as males. And they travel long distance. They can be heard for one or two kilometers, or sometimes more, depending on the terrain and habitat. And uh, they're, they're a very interesting vocalization. They vary a lot within individuals, as you can see from the, uh, these different uh, spectrograms. Oh, that the call automatically playing when I clicked the slide transition button. But what Nisarg has found so far is that there's no evidence for dialects at Gombe, that males in these two communities, the Mitumba community and the Kasekela community, uh, vary more within their vocalizations than between. So here we have uh, each the, uh, these different individuals, these different males. This is Edgar, who's the current alpha male. Um, box plots showing the, uh, the median and interquartile uh, ranges uh, for the rate of buildups, one of the elements uh, in the pet who calls. There's a lot of within individual variation. Uh, and compared to the Kasekela males who are colored in pink, compared to the Matumba males in a sort of turquoise or aqua color, uh, there's pretty much complete overlap in this uh, measure. And uh, looking at principal components analysis of uh, a broad range of acoustic features uh, between these two communities. Uh, the um, Matumba, see, I think, but yeah, Matumba is, is in this turquoise or aqua color, Casacela is in red, and there's pretty much complete overlap uh, between them. And so there's really not much evidence for vocal learning. Um, in this population, not much evidence for dialects, um, even though um, the um, you know these previous findings of, of dialects and chimpanzees have been very widely reported. We don't see evidence for it here. So, if in fact chimpanzees have a limited capacity um, for vocal learning, um, then they're really quite similar to other primates and um, the extensive capacity for vocal learning that humans exhibit is something that emerged later in the hominid lineage after the divergence of Pan and Homo. So what caused the divergence of Pan and Homo? This is one of the big questions in human evolution. 
Uh, there are many different hypotheses, and most of those hypotheses relate somehow to habitat and diet. That uh, you know, there, there's the old saying, "You are what you eat," and if you start eating something different, that can allow you to exploit a new habitat. And what people have long pointed to in studies of human evolution is uh, to the changes in habitat in Africa over the last six to seven million years, as overall uh, habitats, especially in East Africa, have grown drier and more seasonal, making it harder for a chimpanzee to live uh, and um, forcing uh, it is hypothesized human ancestors to evolve to live in these more open habitats, the woodlands and savannas of East Africa and Southern Africa, where we find many hominid fossils. And one thing that has revolutionized studies of human evolution uh, over the past few decades has been uh, the advent of stable isotope research, where uh, people have been able to analyze fossils to infer directly something about the diet of uh, fossil organisms. Now, in order to interpret fossils, we need data on living animals with known diets. And so Rebecca has been focusing on that uh, for her uh, doctoral dissertation, which she finished last fall, looking at the stable isotope ecology of chimpanzees and baboons at Gombe, where we have uh, multiple tissues from these individuals when they die of natural causes. We recover their skeletons and uh, preserve them so that we can analyze um, tooth enamel and um, bone uh, tissue, uh, as well as hair, to um, compare the stable isotope signatures uh, with their known diet, because we see what they're eating, we have a lot of data on what they're eating. And Rebecca is currently working on preparing her, her dissertation chapters for publication. Just a little background on stable isotope analysis. Uh, much of it fo focuses on isotopes of carbon, particularly uh, carbon-12, which is the most common isotope of carbon, and carbon-13, which has one more neutron. It's a somewhat heavier isotope. And because it's somewhat heavier, the um, molecular processes of photosynthesis discriminate differently against these uh, different isotopes. And in particular, there are two main categories of plants that use different photosynthetic pathways. Grasses and sedges are, um, you use a C4 photosynthetic pathway, whereas uh, most forest plants, such as trees and herbs and vines, use a C3 pathway. And these pathways lead to different stable isotope signatures. And so you can, um, through analysis of the stable isotopes in the tissues of uh, fossil as well as recently dead, organisms, you can infer how much um, C3 versus C4 uh, plant matter contributed to their diet. So to undertake this study, uh, Rebecca collected foods uh, from uh, Gombe that were known to be eaten by chimpanzees and baboons and weighed them and brought them back to the U.S. for analysis and also brought skeletal materials back for chimpanzees and baboons. And here is Rebecca at Gombe with some baboons doing something that baboons do a lot of that chimpanzees don't do nearly as much of, which is eating grass. Uh, baboons eat a lot of grass, and uh, so this results in a uh, different stable isotope signature for baboons, even at Gombe, where they're living side by side with chimpanzees. And what Rebecca has been able to infer from what she has learned at Gombe and comparing this to uh, reported data on hominins is that hominins had a very different diet from chimpanzees from very early on. They ate more of these C4 food 
resources like grasses and sedges. Uh, perhaps they were eating grass seeds or the underground storage organs, like here the baboons uh, are digging for grass corms. Um, or maybe uh, they were eating grass-eating animals, uh, such as termites or grazing animals. Uh, baboons uh, living in open habitats today hunt opportunistically, and um, perhaps hominins were hunting opportunistically from early on. Um, but whatever the diet was, it appears to have been quite different from what chimpanzees were eating. So this raises questions about how hominins managed to do this, and people who have uh, been interested in this question have been very interested in what chimpanzees do when they live in open habitat environments. And uh, one of the uh, people in my lab uh, as a guest uh, is uh, Nicole Simmons, who is a graduate student at Makarero University in Uganda. Uh, she's been writing up her dissertation in my lab on her fieldwork of uh, Chambura Gorge in western Uganda. And uh, Chambura Gorge is quite a, a stunning uh, location. Uh, this is a, a photo of the gorge, which is a forest growing along uh, the river in a steep gorge in a landscape that is otherwise very open grassland and woodland. And so Nicole studied the chimpanzees living in this gorge for her dissertation uh, with the goal of finding out um, what is life like for savanna chimpanzees? Do they use savanna resources? How, if so, how often? What savanna resources do they use as a way of gaining insight into what um, our ancestors might have done when they first began uh, using savanna resources more extensively. So what did she find? How do, savanna how do savanna chimpanzees use the savanna? Well, Nicole found that they don't use the savanna very much. They mostly stay in the forest patches. At Chambura, they mainly stay in the gorge where there's a lot of fruit, there's a lot of food, there's not much need to leave. Chimpanzees rely on ripe fruit which uh, mainly comes from trees and vines and shrubs in the forest, so they stay close to the trees and they don't venture much away from the trees. So how did our ancestors survive in more open habitats? This is something that uh, we still don't know the answer to, that many people have proposed different hypotheses, uh, but many of these hypotheses focus on something that is more abundant uh, in these open habitats than in forest habitats, which is protected plant foods, hidden and protected plant foods, like roots, tubers, and nuts. In seasonal, dry, open habitats, plants need to guard their uh, hard-won resources carefully, and so they, they hide a lot of their energy and store it underground in the form of roots and tubers, underground storage organs. And when they grow seeds, they often protect these seeds with nuts. And so most animals can't get to these hidden and protected food resources. Modern humans, contemporary hunter-gatherers who live in these habitats, use tools in order to get these resources. And so it's likely that early hominins also used tools to enable them to survive in these habitats such as digging sticks to dig up underground storage organs and stones to smash open nuts. And um, with pretty simple technology, they could have eaten plant foods that are very similar to what present-day hunter-gatherers eat. In present-day hunter-gatherers, women forage in small groups, and they spend a lot of time digging up roots and tubers and gathering uh, nuts and fruits and um, other plant matter that they take back to their uh, central base, their camp, to process and cook. And early hominins uh, might have done uh, quite similar things in terms of digging up uh, resources, gathering uh, nuts and so on uh, for further processing, possibly taking things back to a central camp uh, for further food processing. And eventually hominins invented cooking and uh, that had enormous consequences for uh, providing more energy from the environment. So early on, I 
raised this issue that humans differ from chimpanzees and bonobos in their mating patterns. And from socio-ecological principles, we can expect that this uh, relates to ecology. So based on what we infer about early hominin ecology, what does that tell us about their mating patterns? People have hypothesized all sorts of different mating patterns. Uh, some people, like Owen Lovejoy, have argued that even very early hominins, uh, like Ardipithecus, were monogamous, uh, like many modern humans are. Of course, not all modern humans are monogamous. There's variation in human societies. Uh, but um, quantitatively, most human marriages are monogamous, even in societies that permit other marriage forms. Or were early hominins promiscuous, like chimpanzees? Or maybe they were polygynous, like gorillas. Um, or maybe they had a, a more, you know, who knows? We, we don't really know uh, what their mating system was like. But we can make some inferences based on body size and sexual dimorphism. So here are um, a pair of Australopithecus afarensis uh, reproduced uh, based on the Lytoli footprints uh, in Tanzania. And they're shown as a monogamous pair, uh, a male and a female. But uh, one thing that is striking, uh, both in this reconstruction and in the actual fossil data, is that male Australopiths appear to have been substantially larger than females, which suggests that they are unlikely to have been monogamous, uh, given what we know about body size, dimorphism, and mating system in other primates. So, here are uh, hominin body mass data from a paper by Grabowski and colleagues in 2015, plotted with um, data on sexual uh, dimorphism in body mass for other primates. So we have female body mass on the x-axis and the ratio of male body mass to female body mass on the y-axis. Down in the lower corner here, we have gibbons, which are uh, monogamous mostly and have very little sexual dimorphism in body size. And in the extreme upper right, we have gorillas, which have very high sexual dimorphism in body mass and also are extremely polygynous. And kind of in the middle here, we have, um, we have some baboons uh, in the genus uh, Papio, shown in these triangles. And we also have gelada monkeys which are a close relative of baboons. Uh, and then here we have in um, the um, green diamonds, body mass estimates for Australopithecus. Modern humans are in um, these squares. Modern humans have pretty low body mass uh, dimorphism, um, a little bit higher than gibbons, which is consistent with the observation that humans um, are often monogamous, but also um, polygyny is a common mating system. Um, and in fact, most uh, societies around the world, uh, polygyny is a, a permitted mating system. So that's consistent with this little bit higher sexual dimorphism in humans than in gibbons. The sexual dimorphism in Australopiths appears to have been higher substantially than humans, and higher also than in Pan, these green circles are um, chimpanzees and bonobos. So this suggests that Australopiths had a different mating system both from modern humans and also for a different mating system from modern Pan. So male hominins early on were 40 to 60 percent larger than females. They were more sexually dimorphic than modern humans, so they probably weren't monogamous. They were more dimorphic than chimpanzees. So they probably weren't simple, simply promiscuous insofar as sexual dimorphism in body mass is a cue of contest competition. Males are bigger than females so that they can fight more effectively among male, uh, with other males for access to mating opportunities. But they're less dimorphic than the gorillas, so they probably didn't have live in isolated harems like gorillas do. The Similarity in sexual dimorphism and body mass to gelada monkeys is intriguing uh, because of other considerations that, like gelada monkeys, early hominins had a multi-level mating system or a multi-level society. 
My graduate student, Carrie Miller, has been studying multilevel societies in the Gelada monkeys, um, in part to gain insights into uh, what early hominin uh, societies might have been like. And in these multilevel societies, uh, the, uh, we see families living within larger societies, much like we see in humans. So this is work in progress. Carrie has been doing genetics to look at paternity and relationships between uh, paternity and uh, male behavior towards offspring. So here is Carrie in Ethiopia, in the, the Guasa uh, highlands of Ethiopia, uh, with gelata monkeys, and these are very fascinating monkeys. Uh, they're closely related to baboons, but uh, they're not in the same genus as baboons. Males are substantially larger than females, and both males and females have quite elaborate uh, visual dimorphism. Uh, males have this bright patch of red on their chest. They have these uh, manes and capes of fur and kind of lion-like tufts on their tails. Females have red patches on their chest uh, that indicate their timing of ovulation and also their, uh, whether they're pregnant or not. And uh, so these societies are um, interesting uh, insofar as they uh, can provide some, well, they're interesting in lots of ways, but for people focused on human evolution as uh, evolutionary anthropologists are. Uh, gelata monkeys are especially interesting because they uh, give some hints as to what Australopith societies might have been like. Now, in order to reconstruct the societies of extinct species like hominins, we need to um, test hypotheses about how ecology relates to behavior. And these hypotheses get very complicated and very difficult. And so one tool to test these hypotheses uh, more efficiently is to use agent-based models of behavior. And my graduate student, Christy Krauss, has been doing this to uh, really broadly test the basic theory of primate socioecology uh, using these agent-based models with a, a novel evolutionary approach in which she doesn't uh, determine what the models do uh, a priori, she allows them to evolve and conducts experimental evolution um, processes to uh, find out how behavior evolves under different circumstances. And to do this, she needs supercomputers, so her field site is the Minnesota Supercomputing Center, and her key technology is agent-based computer models. We have one publication so far resulting from this effort. Uh, this model uh, Christy calls BEGET, um, which uh, is an acronym for uh, Behavior Ecology uh, Genetics uh, and um, a few other things. Uh, that all line up to stand for beget, uh, which means to produce. And uh, this first publication focuses on the evolution of stable bonds between males and females, which uh, has occurred several times independently in the evolution of uh, multi-level primate societies, in Hamadryas baboons and gelata monkeys, in humans and probably our hominin ancestors, and also in some of the Asian colobines, uh, like golden snub-nosed monkeys. So here's a screenshot from uh, the, this beget model in action. And in this model, females are circles, males are triangles, uh, grown individuals are big, babies are little. Uh, females display uh, uh, signs of whether they're pregnant, um, whether they're lactating, whether they're ovulating. So all this information is on display, much like it is in baboons and gelata monkeys. And uh, Christy uh, conducted experiments to see under what circumstances will males uh, stay with a particular group of females 
or will males wander around roving looking for mating opportunities? And so she uh, allowed these populations to evolve, and then she examined the data for uh, what strategies had evolved in males. And those males that changed mates more frequently, she called rovers. They moved frequently from group to group as if they were always searching for fertile females, which is more or less what all of baboons do at Gombe, versus loyalists. These are males who stayed with uh, a particular group of females. They rarely switched groups. Uh, they stayed with the same females even when they were pregnant and lactating. And then Christie conducted experiments where she uh, created virtual populations with uh, males with a rover genotype and males with a loyalist genotype and uh, calculated the percentage of paternities that males with these different strategies evolved or obtained. And when females were in small groups with just one or two females, the loyalists who stayed around with a particular group of females, they sired more of the offspring. Whereas in larger groups, uh, the rovers sired more offspring. And this is consistent with some predictions from socioecology that small group size should favor uh, stable reproductive bonds between males and females. So it's, it's uh, gratifying to see this prediction confirmed uh, in these models. So what can we conclude about hominin mating systems? If females foraged in small groups, then during the day when those females were off foraging, one male could defend females in these groups from other males, just as or similar to what happens in gelato monkeys and hamadryas baboons. Uh, and this would enable males and females to have stable breeding bonds, which could increase the potential for, for male care of offspring, which is something that we see extensively in uh, modern humans. And also, if males and females have stable breeding bonds, then more siblings will be full siblings than half siblings, which promotes cooperation among siblings, which is something we see extensively in humans. Uh, so that's uh, some preliminary conclusions for early hominins, how we got to be the way we are. Now that we are the way we are, how do we prevent ourselves from destroying the planet and wiping out all of the other interesting animals and plants that live on the planet, apart from our livestock and crops. Working on this topic is Elihuruma Wilson Kimaro, who has been working as a park warden for Tanzania National Parks. He's uh, worked uh, in a senior management position at Gombe National Park, and now he is on leave for a few years to uh, conduct his uh, doctoral dissertation uh, in my lab. And he's in the Department of Ecology Evolution, and he is uh, focusing on um, using geographical information systems and remote sensing combined with field work where he will be going uh, to village land forest reserves outside of Gombe to uh, do vegetation plots to ground truth the uh, satellite imaging uh, to measure th the success of the conservation projects in the greater Gombe ecosystem. This is something that the Jane Goodall Institute has invested in uh, enormously uh, with funding from uh, the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. The uh, Jane Goodall Institute has worked with local communities in the greater Gombe ecosystem to conduct village land use plans. And uh, Wilson's project will uh, examine forest and woodland regeneration dynamics in these um, landscapes. So this is a map of uh, Gombe National Park and the surrounding greater Gombe ecosystem. So the park is uh, this little uh, sliver of land here. And also, it's been extended recently to include uh, the lakeshore, uh, which protects an important habitat for fishes endemic to Lake Tanganyika. And these uh, 
Polygons are the ranges of the Matumba, Casacala, and Kalande chimpanzee communities. And outside the park are densely settled villages. And the, um, uh, these darker areas here show the concentrations of human settlement within the villages. Now, starting in the, in the late 1990s, Tanzania law has required that uh, villages undertake uh, village land use plans. And um, within these land use plans, uh, villages can uh, designate areas for um, uh, land used for houses, uh, businesses, land used for growing crops, and also they can set aside land for conservation. And starting in about 2005, the Jane Goodall Institute has worked with uh, villages in uh, surrounding Gombe to conduct these village land use plans. And a consequence of this is that the people in these villages have set aside land, so a substantial amount of land, in their villages for village land forest reserves, which are uh, shown um, within these, these green polygons. Uh, and so quite an extensive area of land outside of Gombe uh, has been allocated by people in the villages for conservation. Now, why would they do this? The people in these villages have learned that there are important conservation benefits from um, protecting forest uh, in terms of uh, things like protecting their water supplies. When there are trees growing on their watersheds, their water uh, supplies are cleaner and the land is less prone to landslides and so they are safer and um, also they can preserve wood for um, various uses uh, by conserving these land, uh, these village land forest reserves. And we have conducted surveys uh, in uh, over the, the past few years of these village land forest reserves, and we've found that there are still chimpanzees living uh, in these forests outside of Gombe, and we have uh, genotyped them and found distinct individuals and found uh, connections between Gombe, that there is some movement of individuals uh, between this area uh, near the border with Burundi and Gombe, some 10 to 15 kilometers away. And so this project by uh, Wilson is just beginning. We don't have results yet, but his focus will be on finding out um, to what extent has forest regenerated and regrown in the areas that, that these uh, villages have set aside as forest reserves and what factors contribute to successful regeneration in different villages. So to summarize, to conclude from uh, this overview of work in progress, regarding sex and violence, um, within group killings occur more often when fertile females can be monopolized more easily because they are few in number. Uh, the work on bonobos is just beginning. It's uh, very important that we learn more about bonobos to understand more about uh, how um, sex and violence have evolved in our closest living relatives. Regarding vocal communication, the chimpanzees at Gombe don't appear to have dialects. Uh, there's little evidence for vocal learning. For stable isotope ecology, uh, it appears that hominins had distinct diets from chimpanzees, uh, even quite early on in hominin evolution. Studies of savanna chimpanzees show that even savanna chimpanzees mainly use forest resources. Studies of multi-level societies, um, I didn't go into detail on this, but what Kerry has found is that uh, the geladas have higher than expected extra group paternity, and uh, we don't yet know what the consequences of this might be for the uh, behavior of males towards uh, infants and juveniles in their units. So that is work that uh, Carrie is currently undertaking for her dissertation. But from the uh, computer analysis, the agent-based computer models that Christie has conducted, small female group size appears to favor the evolution of long-term breeding bonds. And so we see some convergence here with the 
uh, importance of smaller groups of females, uh, both in these multi-level societies and uh, insofar as it relates to violence in chimpanzee societies. Regarding conservation, uh, surveys have found that chimpanzees still persist in the village forest reserves outside of Gobe. So what are the implications for human evolution? Um, first of all, within group killing appears to be driven by reproductive competition among males and the high risk of intergroup killing that exists for the Matumba community at Gombe is not sufficient to promote extensive cooperation, even though that's a hypothesis that um, has been promoted for human evolution. Uh, going back to Darwin, many people have argued that uh, it's the high rate of intergroup aggression in humans, particularly warfare, that has promoted the evolution of extensive cooperation within human societies. Uh, these findings from chimpanzees suggest that uh, cooperation within humans uh, may have been driven by something else. The studies of vocal communication uh, suggest that the key steps in language evolution occurred after the divergence of Homo and Pan. The studies of stable isotope ecology uh, show that humans had distinct diets from chimpanzees, so they must have been eating something else. Uh, chimpanzees can't really use these resources very well. There are some reports of chimpanzees in the savannas of western Tanzania or the woodlands of western Tanzania using uh, sticks to dig up underground storage organs, and it seems likely that more extensive use of sticks and stones helped early hominins gain access to hidden and protected foods. And if they were able to do so in uh, with small stable foraging parties of females, then uh, hominin ecology likely favored the evolution of multi-level societies, particularly if those small stable groups returned to uh, larger sleeping sites in the, uh, to sleep at night, uh, which would bring many uh, such units together. And finally, uh, regarding conservation, uh, Working with local communities is essential to ensure wildlife conservation. Uh, parks alone are not going to be enough to save chimpanzees and other primates from uh, the global domination of the anthropomata, the human team. So I would like to acknowledge the many people who've contributed to the data that I have shown here and the work in progress that I have uh, uh, gone over. Uh, the research staff at all of these long-term projects have uh, worked incredibly hard to provide the, the data uh, that uh, we have been able to review here. Uh, funding and support from the Jane Goodall Institute has enabled Gombe to continue its research into what is now its 60th year, and uh, funding from many other sources has also been important, including the National Institutes of Health the National Science Foundation, the Leakey Foundation, Wenner Grant Foundation, and uh, the Twisa Victory uh, BV from the Netherlands and the University of Minnesota. And uh, we thank the um, Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute, the Commission on Science and Technology, and Tanzania National Parks, and the Uganda Wildlife Authority, and also the agencies in Ethiopia and uh, Democratic Republic of Congo for permission to do this work. Uh, so that is uh, the end of my talk, and I would be happy to uh, uh, welcome questions uh, from the audience at this point. Thanks, Mike. Uh, that was a lot to take in in about an hour. So I guess most of us are still processing that information. We have some questions from YouTube and some from uh, our Zoom viewers. I'll take one by one, but I'll also request the participants to uh, please raise their hands uh, if they need to ask questions directly. So the YouTube questions I'm going to ask on behalf of the uh, YouTube viewers. Uh, someone called Expecto Patronum, pseudonym, is asking you. <laughs> you said that you expected the members of the Matumba troop to help Vincent. Instead he, instead, he was badly mauled and killed by them. Is it common to find various primate groups caring for the injured? Well, um, 
No, it's not common to find primates caring for the injured. So the, the expectation uh, there really comes from anthropomorphizing chimpanzees. So if chimpanzees were like us, then we would expect them to uh, help each other out. Uh, but of course, as, as scientists, we try to avoid anthropomorphizing and uh, record what they actually do. And it turns out that they actually don't help each other out very much. All right. So we're just sticking to the same uh, topic. Amish Dua from YouTube asks, isn't the cooperation better in chimps because most of the males are relatives? Uh, I do not understand why there is more intra-group aggression against the alpha male, even if female population was high. Yes. So within the, the, uh, the question asker is correct that within chimpanzee communities, males are more closely related to females. Males stay in the group that they're born in, whereas few, females usually disperse to other societies. And this um, is thought to be important for the cooperation that we do see among male chimpanzees. They do cooperate with each other to defend group territories, and uh, they also engage in group level activities, uh, especially hunting. So some cooperation occurs within chimpanzees. Um, so why would they kill their alpha male? Um, I think the the answer there is that the alpha male was completely monopolizing, or not completely, but largely monopolizing reproduction before he was killed. So Vincent sired most of the offspring before he was killed. And after he was killed, uh, his attackers, Rudy and Edgar, both increased their share of uh, offspring uh, considerably. Uh, and as Rudy has gone on to kill other males uh, in Mitumba, he his share of paternities has um, increased uh, so that now he, he very much, um, you know, he, he's sired all of the offspring uh, in recent years that we have genotyped. Um, now, it may be relevant that uh, Vincent was not a close relative of Edgar, and that, that Edgar, the male who has gone on to kill these other males, uh, is not uh, closely related to uh, the, the other males that he has been observed attacking uh, severely. So even though the males in general are more closely related to females, some males are more closely related to others, and, and kin selection is probably still an important factor here. All right. Uh, so Umapati wants to ask a question. Uh, sir, can you just unmute yourself or you can ask the question directly? Leaves raise his hand. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very nice talk, very informative talk. I have a, a, a clarification. Uh, I heard that there are the community behave differently uh, uh, within the species, especially chimpanzees. Is that the same for uh, this case also where this particular uh, community is killing is, uh, is a pattern or is it because of some epigenetic modification or it's because of resource availability? Right. So um, how much of the, um, to what extent is the high rate of killing at Mitumba uh, related to factors like resource availability or individual variation, maybe epigenetic factors. The, the shorter answer is that we don't really know because um, the, you know, for one, we, we don't really know anything about epigenetic factors in, in chimpanzees. We, we um, uh, people are starting to learn about uh, epigenetics and, and how it relates to various traits in, in other primates like baboons. It's still early stages for, for chimpanzees for that sort of research. Um, but the, um, and also resource vari variation, um, we would really need to quantify that across sites and do a, a comparison across study sites uh, to really see what uh, can explain the difference. But um, one thing that's, that's interesting is that the, um, 
if we look across study sites, uh, a number of these other very small chimpanzee communities have had high rates of killing, including the Chambura Gorge uh, community. Uh, there's been one uh, within community killing in Chambura Gorge, which makes for a high per capita rate because that's a small uh, study population. Now, there are killings in larger communities as well, and so a small number of females is not necessary or sufficient for within group uh, killings to occur. So there are other factors, and it's and we don't really know what they are at this point. Thank you. you uh, so related to the same topic, uh, there's one question from YouTube by Ishita Ganguly. Uh, she asks if you have found any correlation between hormone level and male fighting behavior in chimpanzees. So um, I haven't done uh, work myself on hormone levels and aggression. And uh, m my graduate student, Maud Mujino, who will be doing that with bonobos, hasn't uh, undertaken that work yet. Uh, but other people who have studied hormones uh, and aggression in, in chimpanzees, uh, particularly Martin Muller, who uh, has studied this for many years in Kibale National Park in Uganda, has uh, found that uh, high-ranking males have higher testosterone levels than low-ranking males uh, when there are fertile females around. And so males appear to modulate their testosterone levels in response to the um, social circumstances, and uh, they are more aggressive with one another when fertile females are present, and it's the high-ranking males that especially crank up their testosterone uh, levels in response to that social context. Uh, have you also looked at, or are you planning to look at uh, uh, the cortisol or corticosterone hormone levels? Uh, yeah, so there, there are other people who are looking at um, cortisone. Uh, Carson Murray has been looking at this in uh, chimpanzees at Gombe and um, I think that Martin Muller and his team have, have looked at, at cortisol, and um, off the top of my head, I don't know uh, how that relates to aggression rates. So, uh, Partha, uh, I'll put you online. He has a question. Uh, okay, maybe he has some trouble with this internet. So, I'll ask uh, one more question from uh, YouTube. Okay. By Ishita Ganguly. It's on the vocalizations. So she asks if uh, I'm rephrasing, paraphrasing her question. Uh, have you seen similar uh, vocal communications in uh, old world monkeys? Are they comparable to vocal communications and old world monkey uh, vocal communications? I, I would say that, you know, broadly speaking, um, old world monkeys and chimpanzees are similar in their vocalization patterns insofar as they they tend to have um, a, a relatively small number of um, call types that um, all individuals produce across all study sites and there doesn't seem to be much role for vocal learning um, in uh, old world monkeys. So they're, in, in those respects they're similar. Okay. So uh, I'll uh, ask Partha's question on his behalf. So he wants to know if you have seen combinatoriality in chimp vocalization. Are there any semantic or syntactic structures? Do you think the lack of dialects could be due to socio-ecological conditions? There are three questions. So. Yes, there are three questions. So the first one, have I seen any evidence of combinatorial um, um, elements in chimpanzee vocalizations. That's a really interesting question. Uh, the, um, the person who has really looked at that most, I think, is Kathy Crockford, uh, who's at the Max, Max Planck Institute in Germany. And um, she has found evidence for chimpanzee dialects in West Africa, Thai forest. And she also, uh, I don't think she's published on this yet, but she uh, gave a talk last year at Max Planck in which she reported uh, some uh, 
evidence for geographical variation in the ordering of the different elements uh, within uh, chimpanzee calls. And one of the things that she pointed out was that many chimpanzee calls are, um, we use two words to describe them because they're kind of combinations of other calls, like the pant hoot is a combination of a panting sound, the <gasps> with the hoot at the end, the whoo! And there are other calls that are combined like that, like the pant grunt, um, the pant bark, and so on. And so um, Kathy Crockford has pointed to, to that as an area that, that might vary geographically. And so that's, that's an interesting topic for research. I haven't looked at that uh, myself. Um, I think Nisard will be looking at that uh, for, for Gombe. Uh, the question of whether there are semantic um, elements to chimpanzee calls is a really interesting one. Uh, there have been a few claims for referentiality in chimpanzee vocalizations, uh, and uh, one of these relates to uh, alarm calls. Uh, chimpanzees have a snake alarm call that is, uh, you know, distinct, and it, you know it clearly conveys information that they have seen a snake to other chimpanzees, um, and. Uh, the, the field assistants at Gombe tell me that they have different alarm calls for cobras versus pythons, uh, which I, um, I, I don't think we have uh, in our sample uh, any of those calls yet. Uh, but uh, I know other researchers at other sites have, have looked at, at this issue. Um, so there's some interesting possibility there. Uh, the other area. Uh, the other type of calls that people have been interested in for their referential properties are food-associated calls. Uh, when chimpanzees have, arrive at food resources, they often give both pant hoots and um, food-associated rough grunts. And uh, people have made claims that that both uh, that there is a distinct food-associated pant hoot, and that the there are different rough grunts for different preference levels of food. Uh, my graduate student um, who graduated a few years ago, Lisa O'Brien, looked specifically at this uh, topic, at uh, rough grunts and uh, whether they are associated with um, different quality of food. And uh, she is, is still working on uh, preparing her results for publication, but um, what she found was that there, there wasn't any uh, correlation between the acoustic structure of these calls and uh, the uh, foods in which they were feeding on when they gave them. So his third question was on, uh, yeah, he asked whether you think the, the lack of dialects could be due to socio-ecological conditions. Uh, thanks for reminding me what the third one was. Uh, and. So could it be due to socio-ecological conditions? Um, it's possible. Um, but I also think that, that even John Matani, who, who reported the first study of, of chimpanzee dialects, um, a few years later after that original study, he posted another study in which he, he walked back the claims about dialects and, and suggested that maybe, well, he, he found that the the variation between communities was small compared to the amount of variation uh, within communities. And the within individual variation is quite high. Um, and and these the dialects that have been reported are really very subtle. And e even the dialects, um, you know, the, the variation reported at, at Thai Forest um, is quite subtle compared to the variation that we see in songbirds or humpback whales or um, any of these other species that, that have clear vocal dialects. Um, so, so I'm inclined to think that the, um, the, this, this view that chimpanzees have regional dialects is, is, is premature um, and may be the result of statistical artifacts. So even between the Western chimpanzees and the Eastern chimpanzees, you think this is a <sighs> Yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I, I think we, we would really want to 
analyze those data in you know kind of a broad context. I think one one thing that would be really nice to do would be a broadly collaborative study across chimpanzees. Um, you know, we're working together with all the people who have collected these these data um, to see what we can find with with larger samples. Because e even um, you know the you know Kathy Cockford's study at at Thai is um, you know has a large sample for this sort of thing in chimpanzees, but even then it's it's really just a few individuals per each community. And so I, I think it's vulnerable to um, statistical artifacts. Now, now with the Crockford study, they, they did also compare the neighboring communities to the more distant communities. And the neighboring communities had more different calls than the distant communities, which suggests that you know, the, the, the authors interpreted that to be um, a product of vocal learning. Um, and I guess I'd like to stay open-minded on that. Maybe, you know, there is vocal learning there, but not in, in East Africa. I don't know. I, th I think we need more, more studies to, to really sort out what's going on. All right. Thanks. So I have a question uh, before we move on to the next one. Uh, this is on uh, Nicole Simmons's work in Kiambura College in Uganda. So uh, she worked on the savanna chimpanzee's habitats in the pretty much they don't use uh, the savannas, but uh, only the forest uh, regions. So do you think there's some uh, imminent risk of climate change affecting these populations? Or there's hu huge risk of climate change affecting primates around the world, uh, including chimpanzees, um, especially in these marginal populations. So um, chimpanzees living in places like Chambura Gorge and in the you know, the savannas and, and woodlands of, um, you know, Senegal and Western Tanzania and, and elsewhere, they're really living on the edge. And as the climate gets um, hotter and drier and more seasonal, uh, those chimpanzees will probably go extinct. They, they just won't be able to make a living um, in those habitats anymore. Uh, so this next question is from uh, Matt Wisdom from YouTube. Uh, do you think you uh, can you hypothesize about the diaspora of Homo erectus through and out of Africa based on primate models? That's a good question. Um, so, if we look at primate models, uh, the we see that there have been previous diasporas from Africa to the rest of the world by, or not to the rest of the world, but at least to uh, Eurasia from Africa. So um, old world monkeys, for example, uh, seem most likely to have evolved in Africa and spread to Eurasia from, from Africa. Uh, the apes also um, appear to have evolved in Africa and spread to Europe and, and Asia from Africa. Uh, so this is something that you know, we, we see in lots of different groups of animals, uh, once, when conditions are favorable for, uh, well, you know, Africa was an island for a long time, an island continent, and once it collided with Arabia, uh, it, that made, um, or once Afro-Arabia collided with Europe, I'm not exactly sure where the, the fault boundary or the uh, collision zone is there. Um, the possibility of moving from Africa to Eurasia existed when there weren't huge deserts uh, in the Sahara and Arabia. Um, and, and even more recently, in a world with lots of deserts, the Hamadryas baboons have managed to uh, colonize Arabia from Africa. So uh, other primates have managed to uh, get out of Africa, but what Homo erectus did is really unusual in terms of the speed at which uh, that happened. Um, and depending on, on who you talk to and how you want to categorize hominin species, uh, many people view um, Homo erectus as, as one species across Africa and, and Eurasia. And so you know, for one species to have colonized uh, all of Eurasia, um, 
or a large extent of Eurasia is, is really quite extraordinary. And that probably had to do with um, the um, ability to um, make and use tools and eat meat at uh, an extensive level that enabled them to survive in habitats where other primates uh, wouldn't be able to. Thanks. Uh, we have Pratik Das from YouTube asking, uh, if, it didn't, if I didn't get it wrong, why was only body size sexual dimorphism considered to predict the mating system of early hominins? So um, there can be multiple factors that go into uh, the evolution of a mating system, but we only have data on the bones. Uh, you know, for fossil hominins, we, we don't you know, have very much to work with. Uh, so the main thing we have to work with is, is their skeletons. And from skeletons, we can infer something about sexual dimorphism, though, of course, people argue about that, and there are different ways of, of making those estimates. Uh, so that's something we have to work with, but it's also something that, that does uh, correlate with mating system in other primates. So it's um, a, a pretty good piece of evidence. Thanks. Uh, so we don't seem to have any more questions from YouTube. Uh, if any participants uh, want to ask, please raise your hands or just shout out uh, so that we can put you in touch. Uh, meanwhile, I just have one more question. So this is on the question of conservation work that Wilson is, has been doing. So uh, you said that there, there, he has found that some of these uh, village donated forests, uh, forest reserves or these patches. Uh, mm -hmm. They are showing signs of regeneration. Yes. So, uh, are there plans to reintroduce chimp groups to these uh, forests, perhaps in the future? Well, some of them already have chimpanzees. Uh, so the uh, the village land forest reserves uh, near the border with Burundi uh, have chimpanzees still living in them. So we don't need to do anything; they're already there, and. I think that um, if regeneration continues and if people continue to protect these forests and also um, protect the wildlife in the forest from hunting, I, I think chimpanzees will uh, you know, begin using these, these forests more extensively on their own. So there, there's no immediate plan of, of adding chimpanzees to the system. All right. So I guess, uh, yeah, that kind of answers my question about that. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Mike. Uh, uh, Mike. Uh, so I, we are done with the questions tonight. I'll just uh, ask Mehreen to come in to say a few words. Mehreen, if you're there. Yeah, it, it's, it was really a very nice talk and very insightful talk. Um, on behalf of Association of Indian Climatologists, I would present my vote of thanks to Dr. Wilson for this uh, talk and the discussion that we had. Uh, of course, it's a pleasure for all of us to know about primate behavior and evolution from Mike himself. Uh, we acknowledge the participants who attended this live uh, webinar. I'm very grateful for your presence. I'm also uh, sure that all of us learned something uh, new today and have something you know uh, more to add to our knowledge. Um, AIP team has been working very hard uh, to present the best works of primatologists from all over the world. And for that, we have a series of talks lined up by uh, eminent primatologists from all over the world um, in upcoming days. So our next speaker is Professor Chamali Nahalage, and uh, she'll be speaking to us live on 22nd of June at uh, 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Um, for more details, you can look us up on our uh, social media handles, uh, Indian Primates on uh, Twitter and uh, don't forget to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, Association of Indian Primatologists, for uh, more interesting talks. And of course, uh, do spread the word. Um, thank you all for making this session a uh, success. And uh, finally, I'll uh, hand over back to Mike for some uh, final few words. Well, I would uh, just like to thank you all very much for the invitation to speak to you. It's an honor to uh, be able to do so. And uh, thanks to all of you who have listened. I'm happy to see 
we have uh, quite an international uh, following here. I see uh, Dismas Mocha from uh, Tanzania is in the audience as, as well as uh, other people from around the world. Uh, and so uh, thank you all for uh, your attention. And I um, am very uh, pleased to see uh, that the Association of Indian Primatology has come into being and wish you success in all of your undertakings. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you.